thanks very much, Michael, and uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here today. Thank you, John, for for having me along. Um, yeah, I, I read the the document, and I know I'm not here to to uh, if you like to to reboot that discussion, but rather I hope to bring it forward. I read the the document, rethinking energy demand, and I guess a few things uh, swirled around in my mind about it. First of all, it's great that we're having this discussion. For so long, it's, we've been hung up on things like efficiency and, if you like, tweaking around the edges rather than saying, OK, this system is really, really broken. And I, I guess I spend a lot of my time trying, sometimes failing, to communicate to audiences unlike the people in this room. In other words, trying to preach to the unconverted and, in some cases, the unconvertible. So maybe today is a little bit different, so bear with me. but. The issue, I suppose, from my point of view, really is where we start from, right? Degrowth. Okay, what do we mean by degrowth? How does an economy predicate it on endless exponential growth? Degrowth. Short answer, it doesn't. It collapses. We're already in an accelerated global ecological, economic, financial collapse. But collapse, don't think of collapse as off a cliff. Think of it more as falling down the steps of the stairs. Different people, I guess they say the future arrives at a different pace. Some people, farmers in Central America, for example, they're already living in the collapsed future, where the climate system upon which their entire existence is based, that has existed for hundreds of years, is gone. Their lives are over. Their new lives are, as will be for tens, hundreds, and thousands of millions of people. Over the next several decades, their lives will be the lives of the climate migrant, of the displaced, of the destroyed, of the ruined. None of this is in the mainstream debate. This is fascinating to me as a journalist, as a human being, that somehow or other this is fenced off psychologically, emotionally, and put into a box called the environment. Asher, the Greens are looking after the environment, lovely bunch, harmless poor devils, but they're great. And they're looking after the environment and we give them two or three percent. Asher, we give them a fifth preference. They're grand, sure, I know your man. You know that fella, he's grand. Bit soft, but they're grand, right? That's where environmentalism is in the politics of Ireland today. Real people, serious people, the grown-ups in the room, as we call them, have no interest in this discussion. So, for example, when we talk about, say, the changes that are happening in our ecological system right now, right? We all know about the 1.2 degree global average surface temperature. That, by the way, on the surface where people live, in other words, the land surface, is already 1.9 degrees on the land surface, okay? Now, we know, of course, where 1.5 average takes us at two. But I find often it's so difficult to translate that to people and say, well, that's nothing, sure, but you know, 14 degrees this morning, it'll be six degrees tonight. What's the problem? So again, as a communicator, I try to simplify things, hopefully not too much, but enough. And to say, imagine your kid is sick and your kid is running a temperature of 38, 39, 40 degrees. That's just a couple of degrees off the baseline of 37. So what happens to your kid? You get them some paracetamol, you cool them down, and hopefully they recover. If you don't, if you can't, then they begin to go into organ failure because the core temperature, our own body's core temperature, for all the 7.8 billion humans on the planet, our core temperature is 37, give or take. Once you leave that, basically you're into a bad place. And the reason I use that analogy is that I'm sure you're all familiar with the nine planetary boundaries, this whole concept that's come out of the Stockholm uh, Institute of Resilience. Now, six, of those nine planetary boundaries have already been breached. Some of them very, very badly breached. Can we recover these? Who knows? The future is uncertain. But what we do know is, if again, as a communicator, I try to simplify this, this is the equivalent of multiple organ failure. And the problem, of course, as we know, is that you can be the healthiest corpse on the slab if 
your liver fails. Every other organ in your body may be absolutely flying, but it doesn't matter because that key organ takes all the other systems down with it. We're in a situation globally of multiple organ failure. The problem here is anyone in this room who thinks that we're going to fix it, look around you, look at each other. We're the same people in the same rooms, 10, 15, 20, 30 years later. And by the way, I defer to those long suffering people who've been at this so much longer than I am. I don't know how you do it. I've only had this blight in my life for 20 years, right? Uh, and actually I'm only 32, you wouldn't think it. But this is what it does to you, right? But, um, but look, we can't look away. This is reality. This is what we face. We can't look away. And besides, everybody else is looking away. So we have no choice. Morally, we have to stare into the void. We have to look this thing right in the eye and say, what do we do? Because as I said about that collapse thing, collapse is already happening in so many different parts of the world. It will continue, but we don't know at what pace, we don't know at what, at what rate, but we do know like a, I suppose, like a ripple in a pond, those waves are heading out. At the moment, people in countries far away who we never hear about in the news, and we don't really care about all that much, they're already getting washed away by the waves, but those waves are heading faster and faster in our direction. So the notion, the idea that somehow or other, we're gonna ride this one out, I'm afraid that's not the case. Um, I suppose I sometimes think of the analogy, if you remember the, um, the, 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 the cartoon of the Roadrunner. Remember the coyote and the Roadrunner? Yeah, that the um, coyote invariably ran over the cliff. I looked left, looked right, everything was fine, looked down, boom. But I would like to think we're not facing that kind of a cliff or even like the coyote that we can fall, dust ourselves off and continue for the next cartoon because there's still absolutely everything to play for. That's the thing. But from my point of view, what's so frustrating is that we're still having, you'll pardon my French, bullshit conversations. The idea that we're somehow going to carry our existing civilization, our consumerist civilization into the future with us, as if that was even a good idea, by the way. I'm going to be doing something later on about Halloween, right? About Halloween has become the new Christmas. It's now become this gigantic festival of one single use waste. And this is happening, by the way, in the teeth of an ecological emergency. Parents amusing their young kids. And these are parents who you would imagine would have such a strong connection to what's coming down the line. And the question I suppose that leaves me gasping is how did we end up so completely detached and disconnected? From, from it. And I suppose, I remember going to a, a lecture in, in Belfast just before lockdown with uh, George Mambio, who I'm sure most of you know very well. And he was describing the rise of neoliberalism. And he basically said that after the oil shocks in the 1970s, societies were, were displaced and shocked. And they were looking around for a new idea. And luckily, the neocons had been working away on this for 30 years. And they basically said, here's an idea. And everybody went, oh, okay. We used to think this is completely nuts, but now that you mention it, you really seem to have thought this out. So we're gonna run with that idea. And essentially that's what we've done for the last 40 years. We've taken neoliberal turbocharged capitalism and blasted ourselves off a cliff at the worst possible time. And the point that he was making when he said that is, those who in times of crisis have the best ideas, they win. We have to be prepared. There's a bunch of fascists out there right now. Call them eco-fascists. I see them online all the time. They're rubbing their hands, by the way, in glee at ecological breakdown. They want to use it to amp up hatred, racism, xenophobia, close our borders, kick the foreigners out, all that kind of stuff. That is coming. There is that narrative out there. And you will find a version of of, of green that you really, really wouldn't recognize and certainly would be horrified to be associated with. But we're gonna be hearing a lot about environmental fascism. So my point is we need better ideas, much, much better ideas. Now, I think by the way, in the document, I think we have some of those ideas, absolutely. Where I was left struggling a little bit when I was reading that is, it reminds me again of that, that, that childhood tale 
of the troublesome cat, the older mice. And they were constantly being harried by the troublesome cat. So they got together and they came up with a brilliant plan. And the plan was when the cat was asleep, they were going to come out and pop a bell around its neck. It'd be brilliant. Until they decide, well, who is going to bell the cat? And that's where that particular plan ran into the ground. I'm still struggling. And I say this with the greatest of respect to people in the room here. I want to know who's going to bell the cat. Who's going to get the alarm bell around the neck of the system that is dragging us over the edge. Thank you very much.